Welcome into the KSO Show. Mason Voth, KSU underscore fan, Drew Galloway here with you as we are ready to go on our normal Sunday time slot after a pretty brutal Friday. Uh, I mean, if you're not listening to this, I totally understand. I would probably run away from uh, whatever that disaster was in Stillwater. Uh, that's, you know, there there are beauties and perks to doing this, you know, being somebody that grew up as a K-State fan and, you know, spent four years there and graduated from there. Uh, just like, you know, Drew and Fan both did. But there are also some downsides to it, which are uh, you can't run from the losses. Like, you know, my dad is is sitting at home right now. He's probably not worried too much about having to talk about K-State losing to Oklahoma State. He's he's probably already moved on to whatever his next project is at work. It probably bothered him Friday night and a little bit Saturday. He can run from it. Now, this entire week, we have to run headed into it. And then also... Uh, face the fact that, you know, Drew and I, we could come up empty with a pretty nasty trip to Lubbock uh, if things don't get figured out for K-State. But uh, it did not go well for the Wildcats down in Stillwater, a 29-21 loss to Oklahoma State. Uh, fan, I'll, I'll start with you. And and you had to watch it on a little bit of a delay, which I'm sure was maybe even worse uh, than, <laughs> than what you would have wanted. Uh, what did you take away from K-State's game with the Cowboys? I, I was <clears throat> pretty shocked about how bad the offense performed, especially the passing game against what, what I had thought going into the game was the worst pass defense in the league, um, and the stats had shown that. But obviously um, some of that, you know, I credit OSU, I think, you know, that may be one of the catches of this game is you have a new defensive coordinator for Oklahoma State and uh, Nardo. And and I think that they were able to make some changes during the bye week that clearly I don't think we anticipated or, or, or uh, prepared for because we looked unprepared most of that first half when, when we really struggled to get anything going on offense. So one good drive, everything else was was pretty mediocre that first half. So I think there were definitely some miscommunications and, and you know, defense wasn't great either, but I think the defense played well enough to win. At the end of the day, offense has to do much more than they did in Stillwater, and that was – I did not expect that at all. I did not expect Will Howard to play that poorly, and uh, to, and, and the offense to me is the, the, the story. Yeah, well, real quick, uh, the ultimate football is football, Brian Nardo – uh, the the resume would make you question how this guy was able number one yeah. to get this job at Oklahoma State and number two how K State wasn't able to do anything against them. Uh, prior to this year, he was at Gannon for a year, whatever the heck Gannon is. Uh, then he he did spend two years at Youngstown State as their linebackers coach, but prior to that, he spent eight seasons <clears throat> as the defensive coordinator at Emporia State. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like this this guy prior to coming to Oklahoma State this year only had four years of experience at a division one football school. And it was two years as a linebackers coach at Youngstown state. And it was two years at Ohio as a grad assistant. Yeah. Uh, so it's, I mean, it's, it's a mystery. And again, like that stuff can happen. You, you can come from all walks of life and know the game. Uh, but that's one of those that's pretty disappointing. And uh, K-State wasn't able to, to get anything done there. Drew, I mean, you were right there next to me watching it on Friday night. Uh, now that you've had some time to process it, what's what's your biggest takeaway? Yeah, I mean, the biggest takeaway for me uh, probably is that we haven't seen K-State play that bad since 2020, the last two games. And it's kind of like Fando said, like they just didn't look prepared. They didn't look ready on offense. Like we, we spent a lot of time talking about how the bye week <laughs> probably came at a good time for K-State. But what we didn't touch on was kind of what Fan said. Uh, Oklahoma State had so much turnover, not just with players but staff, that it probably came at a good time for them. So it, they they looked really inspired, and the crowd was the crowd was I thought a lot better than the Missouri crowd even was. So it was it came at a good time for them because I think that if they would have played again after the loss to Iowa State, maybe their spirit is broken. But there's probably like there there's just no excuse for how poorly Casey had looked and played. And <clears throat> it it was weird because you saw more frustration after the game than I think you saw during the game. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, 
No, that game got off to a terrible start because that was the most uninspiring, you know, start to the game, which is which is weird for K State because they get the ball. They had scored the first time every game up to that point. They had come out ready to go. They were ready to work, and maybe it was telling early on that it was going to be an off night for Will Howard because you know I was on the field for it, so I didn't get a great look at how you know the plays develop. But maybe that was a circumstance where there were some things there, and Howard wasn't able to hit. But for K-State to come out and go three and out immediately, it's not a good thing, especially when this defense that we know has some problem spots can, you know, give up some plays, give up some yardage and ultimately points. You put yourself in a bad spot early if you're going to go down seven nothing on the road, uh, no matter who you're playing. And that is exactly what happened. And Oklahoma State was really down for the, the test the rest of the way. But the defense, we'll talk about it. Because there are some glaring problems with the defense. It's easy to see. It's easy to point out all of these things. But to me, it's clear that the defense is not the problem. I mean, they gave up only one touchdown on on Friday night. Now, they did give up five field goals, and one of the other ones was blocked. So, uh, you know, you, you're putting them in position to where they can score. But the defense did enough to win this game. It's the offense, number one, not being able to really do much of anything, and then also the offense giving seven points to Oklahoma State with the pick six right before the half. Um, I mean, we can we can give our thoughts on the defense, but to me, it's just it's a young group. It is guys with inexperience that have to play a lot more to to be out there, and maybe you know as the season goes on, they'll get better this year, or it will have to be for next year, but. There are teams and there are situations where the standard is different for certain players, certain sides of the ball, because, you know, we know what it is. You have to step up. Like, I mean, think of the Kansas City Chiefs. If the Chiefs defense goes into every game and they give up 21 points, you know, like, yeah, maybe that's a little bit high to every single game, give up 21 points. But you know what? If the Chiefs give up 21 points every game, they should win every game they play because. They've got Patrick Mahomes, and they've got you know the the genius that is Andy Reid or whatever. They should win every one of those games, and if they don't, and they lose a game, say twenty one to twenty, you you can harp on like oh the defense gave up this or that, it's not their fault. It's like if the Chiefs had lost to the Jets last Sunday, if they lose that game, that is on the offense. And I mean honestly, Patrick Mahomes tried to play the worst game in a long time and give it to him. Uh, ultimately, he was able to pull it out. And you think of other walks of life where, I mean, think of like, now this is a little bit different. And, you know, some people will probably be like, well, actually they do play good defense. Um, I don't know how much of that's true anymore. But like you think of the Golden State Warriors, if the Warriors in their, in their heyday go out there and they shoot 29% from three, but they've taken like 50 of them in a game and they end up losing a game, you know, 110 to, to 101, you're like, oh man, one ten. That's a lot to give up. I don't know. Maybe the shooters should have, you know, done what they do. Like they, that is the bread and butter of them. For K State, this offense is where it's supposed to be. You have a lot of experienced guys now, not necessarily at the receiver position, which is a problem all in itself that we'll talk about. But Will Howard has been here four years now. He should know what he's doing. The offensive line, most of those guys have been here five years now. They should know what they're doing. And everybody offensively is kind of being a letdown for K-State right now because now in both losses, the defense has done enough. The defense has given plenty of opportunities for K-State to win those games against Missouri and Oklahoma State, and the offense, which is supposed to be the star, has not come through in either of those games. I'll throw this out there just because, I mean, we hit on it with just how bad of a start it was, and it, it's something that actually like just clicked with me uh, that like we, we didn't ask Kleiman because I think everybody was just so – what the hell just happened? I wonder if they had a redo if they defer instead of taking the ball. Yeah, I mean, I it's interesting. And I, now they'll probably really think hard about it based off of what took place uh, on on Friday night. I mean, you think if you go into Lubbock and you win the the toss, are you, are you really taking the ball again? Or do you think a little bit more about <laughs> that decision? It's it's interesting because they've been so good when they've mm -hmm. taken the ball to start games. Um, unfortunately, just, you know, this one, it, it backfired on them in a pretty serious way. It was crazy because uh, D.Y. and I were talking about it because I, 
I made the joke because K-State has won the toss every game this year, and I felt like they won every game uh, yeah. uh, in the coin toss last year. I said, what do you do if you win? I think that I would probably defer this one and let the defense try to make a stand because the hard part about taking the ball is if you don't score, it looks so bad. Yeah. Well, and even worse, if you don't score and you only run three plays, it, like K-State did, it, it feels like an extra loss. Like you can, you can go out there and move the ball a little bit, but, oh, hey, drive stalled, whatever. And K-State didn't get the ball moved down the field at all, and it was just three terrible plays. And it, immediately, I can guarantee you, if you and I are watching that thinking, oh, this is not a good start, like here we go, the players definitely have to be thinking that because they're the ones playing the game. They're the ones that can see it playing out. They're the ones that know their teammates and know the feel of the team. Like that, it was just it was it was a bad start, and it led to a bad game for K State. Yeah, it, I mean, I, I I see the point about deferring, but I'm, I'm Mason. I think your point of this team has been really successful the first drive of every game, so. Um, I, I completely understand taking the ball as well because, I mean, you, did, you went to Missouri and even though it wasn't a Friday night game, you still went down and scored. Um, but, yeah, I think the, the surprise was being that bad to go three and out on the first drive and 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 not really threaten. Um, it was interesting because, you know, I was I charted not all the game yet, but most of it. And uh, on second down, they, they tried to run an RPO. And this is where I think, you know, I think that's where you, you – uh, I think they had sent it going to the flat and uh, that's where you get questions in your head where you think usually your first few plays, you have something dialed up that you are pretty sure will work. And then when they stop it and defend it really well, um, the third down play was, ended up being a short throw. Obviously uh, OSU had the backs in covered up. So he had to dump it down to Jane Jackson. I think it was. So when, when you come out and, and you, you know, as a coach, when you prep, especially with two weeks, you think we've got three or four plays dialed up that we know are going to work early in the game. And when those don't work, that's really tough because because it it then you're on your your heels to start the game. You're already making adjustments after your first drive. You usually want to make those adjustments after drive two or three uh, after the defense adjusts to your plan coming in. And, and it looked like K-State wasn't – had no idea uh, – and had no prep for what OSU actually did on defense to start that game. So that makes it really tough. And that does put you in a corner as an offense coordinator when that happens to you. Now, is that, I mean, is that something where the, where K state is limited by their receivers right now with what you can do to open up a game? I mean, we've seen them at times be able to move it down the field, but it does seem like there are some, there are some serious limitations to how you can throw the football to Phillip Brooks and Jaden Jackson and RJ Garcia and Keegan Johnson at this point. Yeah. I, I think that, I think that showed up in the game as well. Uh, there were at least three or four shots down the field, one-on-one -on -one press coverage uh, where case they had no separation and Oklahoma state had us blanketed uh, on a couple fade throws down between the numbers and the, the sideline uh, specifically remember. And that's tough when, when, and really, you think about how we beat Oklahoma State last year is we got some big plays on mm -hmm. in the passing game, and and that was not happening until you know we the first successful drop back pass did not start until uh, the the throw to Ben Sinnott in the second half. Uh, every other every drop back pass in the first half was an unsuccessful play that was either incomplete or uh, a sack. So when that happens, and and that that was really you know one of my major concerns about the offense coming in to this game was our drop back pass success rate was 39%. We were averaging like six and a half yards per play on drop back passes this year coming into this game. And that obviously only went down after this game and, and cause I haven't finished it yet, but it, it was worse. Um, so that's a, that's a real big problem. I think part of that is <clears throat> the ability of our receivers to, to, to get open, you know, even Cade Warner was sneaky good about yeah. getting open in, man coverage situations and and you know Knowles obviously was a bigger more explosive type player that could get open in some of those situations so uh, clearly we're missing some of that ability and we don't have it right now yeah well and that's one of those things that I, I think would be interesting to to ask Chris Kleiman or 
um, or Will Howard about. Now, it, it, it puts them in a tricky spot on how they have to answer it, but it's it's clear that you're missing a type of receiver like that. And it's wild to think that, like you said, hey, if this offense had Cade Warner, things would be a lot different. I think they'd be a lot different because, I mean, I don't know who I was talking to. Maybe it was Drew or, or somebody else on Friday night. But can you name one time this season – other than maybe Ben Sennett, so a receiver where Will Howard has hit a receiver where he's had to throw the ball kind of over the top and get him on the run, like in that man coverage situation where you beat your guy because the downfield passing success has come when a guy has been either wide open or like he's kind of cutting in the middle field like you think of Jaden Jackson's first touchdown of the year. Now, Will Howard has clearly been off and inaccurate this year in some, some spots. But I also think it comes down to the receivers. The separation they're getting in those situations is minimal. And again, people, some people don't like it that I, I, I brought it up. Um, but Phillip Brooks is 5'8". He is the shortest receiver in the Big 12 with Brennan Presley. You can't throw some of those balls to Phillip Brooks, which is unfortunate because he's your best receiver right now. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I, I know people didn't like that. I was, I, the math said that Houston was the tallest receiving group in the Big 12. And let me tell you, Houston's receivers are not their problem right now. Donovan Smith threw for 330 yards and four touchdowns, no picks against Texas Tech. Uh, probably helped that he had some big receivers to throw to. I just think that right now, like if you ask Chris Kleiman or Will Howard, I mean, h- how much are you guys missing Malik Knowles and Cade Warner? The honest answer would be pretty significantly. I don't know how they would actually say it. And, you know, that was one of the things that maybe I was trying to get at with, with Kleiman. I asked him, more so from the the emotional and philosophical side, I just said, what are you guys missing there that you didn't have from last year's team? Like, obviously, you lost the the great physical talents and on field guys from last season, but is there something else that's missing? And when he, you know, just said, uh, "That's that's on us coaches to figure out." I think that's pretty telling. I think that this this seems like a team right now that lacks a legit leader, and they lack guys that can can get them moving and believing in the right direction when things are going poorly. And I don't know, I don't know how you're going to figure that out because I think what you're dealing with is you think about the guys on last year's team, they had all been playing at K-State for a long time at that point. I mean, Deuce Vaughn, three years and he was legit ever all three years playing. Felix DK Uzama playing, been here a while, all that stuff. Um, you can just go down the list of guys that stepped up. Now you think about the dudes that are here. Will Howard's in his fourth year, yes, and he probably should be more of a leader, and I think he he probably tries, but he's also been the backup quarterback for the first three years. It's not really his place to come in and be that guy, so he's trying to figure that out. You think about other guys on the team, like Austin Moore is probably the best player on defense for K-State right now, Austin Moore is a, a great player, a great dude, but there's never been one thing that Austin Moore has done that's made me think that's probably a pretty good vocal leader in the locker room. I just don't know that it's in his personality um, based off what we get to see and what we get to hear. And I think that they are probably missing those guys right now. And I just that's that's something you're going to have to overcome and, and probably challenge guys a lot more. And I think Chris Kleiman kind of tried doing that with how direct and forward – he was in his press conference on Friday night, and we can we can jump into it there. I know Drew, you were obviously there. I don't know if you got to watch any of it, fan, um, and hear what he said. But it was the most direct and pissed off that I'd ever heard Chris Kleiman with, and just how open he was about everything. Uh, where he came in there, and I, very rarely are you going to hear a coach, especially. You know, you could hear a coach of a team that goes 0 and 12, and they're not going to go in there and say that they're a bad football team. Chris Kleiman walked in there and said, We're a bad football team right now. And he was pretty open and honest about the fact that, yeah, Will's struggling right now. Um, But everybody else is too. I know some people didn't like that he said, Yeah, turnovers are a big problem, but also we got to force turnovers. He's right on both of those. I mean, I, I know I defended the defense earlier, but. They have to force turnovers. They're not doing it, and it's a killer because you would have liked in that game against Oklahoma State just to get one big play. The O State defense got three big plays for them. If you could get just one of those if you were K-State, then you are in a different position. Um, He was also 
open and honest about the Will Howard, Avery Johnson conversation. You know, that did you consider Avery at all? You hadn't played him in the last two after playing at, at Mizzou. Uh, and he just said that those were conversations that they had. Um, so we'll see what comes out of it. Drew, you were there, so I'll let you, you take the lead here. What did you make of how Chris Kleiman handled everything after the game Friday night? Yeah, I mean, we we actually talked about it right after uh, the press conference. I said, I don't think I've ever seen him this mad after anything. It, it was the most candid and honest, I think, that we've ever seen him. It's like you said, I, I mean, I, I've never heard a coach say just directly that we're not a good football team, and I told the guys that. So I think that he's really trying to light a fire under a lot of them because I, I think that they he knows what the team needs. Like after the Missouri loss, he was pretty calm and and he was right when he said that Missouri was a good football team. I mean Missouri just lost their first game this yeah. week. But to but so he knows how to push the buttons. So I'm interested to see how the response comes from this. And with the Avery Johnson, Will Howard stuff, I, I do see where he's coming from because the environment was a lot different than the Missouri environment. And the worst thing that you could possibly do is throw somebody out there that's not probably not ready for that. And, and you could make an argument that Avery is ready for it, but you also don't want him to come in there and just get his confidence shattered as well. Yeah, I, it's it's a it's a tough thing. Here's the here's the thing though, you're not asking Avery Johnson to go in there and and play 20 plays in that game against Oklahoma State. You're going in there to have him. You know, you you have maybe at max 10 plays where he's going to be in there. That seems high for what you need. You only have a couple. I mean, Will Howard and Hayden Gillum screwed up down there, and they've been here for a long time. You know, I. I'd be open that if if I have veteran guys screwing it up, let me take a chance with the guy that has a skill set that could really help us in this game because for everything Will Howard did poorly in the game on Friday night, he ran the ball well. He was over 100 yards rushing. I wonder if the quarterback that runs like a running back and receiver but can also throw it like a quarterback, I wonder if he would have been helpful in that game. The answer is probably yes. And if – you know, this is just how I see it. If I have guys that know what they're doing and they're still screwing it up, I'd rather take my chance with the guy that I feel like has more talent for what we want to do there. Now, do I think that Avery Johnson is more talented in terms of being a, a Big 12 quarterback right now than Will Howard? I do not. I don't think so. I think that overall, K State is at this point, I mean, there things can change, but Will Howard is your, still your best option moving forward. But I don't, I don't like the, well, you know, tough crowd and some of the cadence problems, all this stuff. I get that, but you could have had a few times where you threw Avery Johnson out there on Friday night and you didn't. Um, and I just kind of wonder if, if this is going to be some kind of internal struggle back and forth again. I mean, you think about the, all the, the Skylar Thompson and Alex Delton stuff that went on where, Colin Klein was kind of, you know, digging in and he wanted one guy to be out there and, and Bill Snyder wanted another. And I don't think it'll get to that point. And, and you have much better options here than what those versions of, of Thompson and Delton were. But this is one of those things right now where I, I think that they should have put Avery Johnson in there for a couple of plays. They should not have benched Will Howard. They should not have replaced him. But you definitely could have used Avery to get something going and they didn't. And I think that the defense that Chris Kleiman gave of it, I mean, it, it may stand up to others and that's fine. To me, I don't really like it. I think it's a cop out. I think it's a way to kind of shield yourself from from not playing him in that game. And I'm sure that Chris Kleiman has regrets about not doing it just to see what could happen because they were running it so successfully with the quarterback. Imagine if you threw the guy in there that actually could run the football. Yeah, I, I, I think that's valid. I, I almost think this. I mean, all we can do is speculate because we're not in the meetings with these guys. But it, it almost seems to me that they have decided to redshirt Avery Johnson. I mean, it doesn't make any sense that there's not a package for him. You had a package versus Mizzou, and you haven't had one since. Um, and Will Howard was banged up. So, so my my speculate again, complete speculation yeah. is that they've had the conversation that it's either going to be. Will show or Avery show. It's not going to be some 
Will's mostly show and Avery for a package or two of play. So that that would be my speculation right now is that they are going to try as much as they can to to redshirt Avery Johnson. If he's got, you know, he may play later in the year with the, the two games he's got left and they're saving them for whatever reason. Um, and, and they they only want to use them if they have to and they know they can and get away with redshirting him. And then obviously that, that must mean Rubley doesn't have what it takes to be a, a special package type player or uh, get a package like that. So that's my only thought on that. I, it, it is perplexing, um, but it's got to be that because there's no other reason not to throw him out there for, you, for a few plays. Like you said, if, if, if they're not playing a red shirt this year, he could play five to 10 yeah. snaps per game. I, I, I think that you're probably right on that. So when I, w- with what I'm about to say, I'm not saying that your logic is wrong or that you're wrong. I think the logic is flawed then with how in two in two realms I think it's flawed with how the staff has decided to go about this if that's the case then so like let's play off of this as K-State has decided hey we're going to redshirt Avery Johnson this year so we only have two more games left to use him number one redshirting Avery Johnson is silly in itself I mean you think about what you know Colin Klein and Chris Kleiman and everybody has said his his star and talent level is at. If he is that good, guys like that aren't just going to willingly stand around and, and play college football for five years. And again, like you could make the, the argument that, well, there's really not like Avery doesn't project as like an NFL guy right now that, you know, if there was the extra year, he would probably use it as opposed to leaving early. But, you know, four years is a long time to be in college. Like some of these guys that have been here for, for that long, like, I don't know how Daniel green's doing it. I mean, I get that they're getting to play big time football and I wasn't, but by the time I got to that final semester in my fourth year, I was like, yeah, this is probably about the right amount of time to be here. I'm, I'm ready to be done with this. Like it was fun. It's awesome. Do I wish now sometimes I could be back in that position? Yeah, probably. But and when I got to the end of it, I was like, man, this is it's just, you know, it's it's kind of gotten old. It's it's time to move on. It's whatever. So I think if he's as good as you think and and given everything else, it's it's kind of a fallacy to think that he's going to be here five years, even if you red shirting. Now, the second thing, and this is the other path we can go down, you still have two games that you can use him. The games that I would try to use him in are the games where you know, pardon my language here, earmuffs to the kids in the car, when shit hits the fan and you're in a tough spot against what we think is a crappy Oklahoma State team, I would use the guy that maybe has a skill set to make something pop off. I mean, we saw Trayshawn Ward get a few more carries in, you know, the that middle part of the game there in the, the second half than DJ Giddens. And I think it was because DJ Giddens is the better running back than Trayshawn Ward right now. But for what they needed, they needed the home run hitter right there. They were trying to get something to pop off. So they needed Trayshawn Ward's skill set. That's kind of what you use in Avery Johnson. When when you actually need him is when you should use him. Don't be saving Avery Johnson and have him play one of those games that you think you might need him at the end of the year. Or, oh, you know, we, we want him in case we're beating Houston by 28 in the fourth quarter, which right now that might be a stretch to assume that they can do that based off how they played on Friday night. But that's not the scenario you should use him. Avery Johnson, with his talent and the fact that you already used him in that game against Missouri because you thought there's something that we can exploit here, we need him in the quarterback run game, you should be using him in a game like what you just played on Friday night against Oklahoma State because your back was against the wall, you were struggling to throw the football, the only thing that was working was quarterback run. Will Howard is successful at it. But I know a guy that probably be a heck of a lot more successful at it, and it's the dude that can run better. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a lot of good points. I, I still, I'm still just. I think it's just how when Will Howard came in, and you could tell that his confidence was shot, and just not wanting to repeat that again. But, I mean, you're not wrong. The only thing that was really working offensively the whole game was quarterback run. Yeah. But th- then the hard part is when Avery comes in, at some point you got to let him throw it, and then the receivers have been an issue. It's true. Well. Yeah, you're you're not giving a freshman quarterback the, the best, you know, 
like pantry to work with, you know, you say, Hey, go make me a, a five course meal and you open it up and there's nothing there really. You're looking at, you know, maybe some like stale graham crackers and, you know, expired, I don't know, baked beans in there. Like that. It's just there. It's not a great state of affairs for the K-State receiving room. And that's why y- you need a guy like Trey Spivey to probably shoot up real quick. Um, and, and I think that's maybe been, a little bit of a, a of a disappointment this year is how the receivers have played, and and obviously Keegan Johnson's saga is all its its own thing. Um, I just I get what you're saying there, and that makes sense too. But also Avery Johnson is a different type of guy than what Will Howard was when he came in. I mean, Will Howard came in in COVID as a just a three star dude from random Pennsylvania town that none of us had ever heard of until Will Howard came from there, and like three star, like there were zero expectations for Will Howard. I mean, honestly, it's it's insane that Will Howard was having to be the backup quarterback as a true freshman in 2020. Avery Johnson comes in as a four star guy that has had all this hype for three years now. He is he has wore every expectation and handled it with grace. He came in. And he very quickly and easily supplanted Jake Rubley, who had been here for three years as a starter, as the, the backup quarterback. And you throw him out there for his first game. He did throw the ball in that game. He also his very first drive drove down the field and scored a touchdown, which I get it. It's garbage time against an FCS school. But if you want to talk about there being pressure on a guy, there's all the pressure on the world in, with Avery Johnson in that situation. Like he, you are the you know the chosen one the whatever yeah. you're the the biggest <clears throat> player to come to k-state in a long 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 time because of being a kansas kid and what you can do at that position the, the most important position on the field and he went out there and they scored a touchdown and they very easily could have scored a second one uh the the next time down the field like I, he can handle it he is a different type of of makeup and dude than Will Howard when he came in. And that's not even a slight to Will Howard. Like Will Howard is what 75 to 85% of college football players when they show up on campus as freshmen are like, they do need that time. They do need to, to be kind of eased into things. You can't just throw them out there. And, and that's why it probably was unfair to Will Howard. And then you think they played crappy teams to start when he got the starting job. So they rattled off wins against, uh, TCU and KU, and so it looked like, oh, hey, there you go. Some more expectations were on him because K-State was ranked. They were cruising. They were in the lead in the Big 12, and he, he just probably wasn't ready for it. Avery Johnson would be ready for that. Like, there are some learning curves that he'd have to come, but you know what I feel confident in is Avery Johnson probably could have gone out there and thrown you three interceptions on Friday night, and I'm not trying to feed into the, hey, who should play quarterback? Should it be Avery full-time? Should Will go back out there? I'm not trying to do that. But if you're trying to make all these cases for why probably wasn't the right situation for Avery Johnson, explain to me how it was the right situation for Will Howard because he did not prove it on Friday night. Well, I I would just say, I would say the coaching staff is just, and Will Howard himself are just as surprised at how bad he played as anybody. I think, and I think you have a, a coaching staff that trusts him a lot and just figured, I think the whole game they're thinking, Will's going to get this figured out and and play well, and he never really did. I mean, he had a, you know there are a couple of good drives in the second half where we went down and scored it, um, but I I thought we got the ball back late in the game. I thought here we go, we're going to drive down and tie this thing and 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 get to overtime somehow and and eat this thing out because you know sometimes those games happen, and I Will Howard should be good enough to make that happen, but uh, you know that to me this. For, for playing a whole game, this was probably Will Howard's second worst game of his entire career. Uh, West Virginia, his freshman year being the only one yeah. worse. The only, yeah. It's only at the time he threw three interceptions. I mean, he had the, the last time we played Oklahoma State, he split time with with uh, Lewis and had a bad game. And then the, the Iowa State game during COVID was awful, awful, but he split time with Ast in that game. So both of his other games were his QBR and his – quarterback rating were as bad as this game were split time games besides that West Virginia game. And I, I think nobody would have expected him to play as poorly as he did and, and make some of the poor. And, and I don't know, 
you know, in the, in the moment of the game, I think it's easy to look back and say, man, we should have done something different. But I think in the game, you just keep thinking, well, Howard is a good player. He's yeah. going to get this figured out. And I think that's probably what they got caught up in. Um, Oklahoma State also did some things. You know, they controlled the ball. They ran the ball 50 percent of the time instead of 35 percent of the time. So so they made some adjustments to kind of control the clock. They won the time of possession. Um, so some of those things played in our those hands. But you're not going to win many road games when you're minus three in turnovers, period. Yeah. And that was my – going to the game, uh, I, I went on with, with Scott on Bosco's boys, and he did ask me what would it take for K-State to lose. And I said, number one, if K-State's minus two or minus three in turnovers. And I didn't expect that to happen. I thought maybe we'd throw a pick. Like that early one where, you know, we'll try to make – you know, that's the play you're talking about. Jane Jackson made that play almost the same scheme, I think, on that deep post route. Um, I think in this one, Will anticipated different coverage, and they dropped a safety where uh, he thought he would come up and, and help on Ben Sennett, and he did not. And, and uh, you know, I think that's one of those things where, you know, I think Oklahoma State baited him into a couple bad throws, and they and, were really bad. And one of the picks, I mean, Christian three-man rush, Christian Duffy just got – obliterated yeah. and there was nothing he could do and it, you know some of those at that point like you're trying to make a play like you're trying to play catch up if you're will howard and this is like what i just said about avery johnson and all that the, it's not really meant to be shots at will howard honestly yeah. like I, I i agree i think coming in this you expected will howard to have a great game obviously i did i i think that for some of the deficiencies he's had this year yes has he been as sharp as last year probably not but He's not the problem. I mean, the receivers are clearly a glaring issue in all of this, and you have some problems there. He's trying to make up for it. He's trying to figure it out. And like after the game, when he he you know was talking to us, it was clear like you could get the feel. Yes, he he knows that he has to go out here and he has to take the blame, but he's probably thinking in the back of the head, what am I supposed to do when the only reliable target I have is my tight end, which you know, Ben Sennett is incredible and everything, but it has to, it takes some serious work to get Ben Sennett open now because he's the only real threat that K State has in the passing game. Like Colin Klein is probably barely sleeping at night trying to find ways to scheme him open because, I mean, it's, it's essentially like Travis Kelsey level with the Chiefs, where now defensive coordinators in the NFL still suck at doing that, uh, right. at stopping him. But, that their sole focus is to okay, this guy finds a way to get the ball every time. We have to make sure he doesn't. And it's a little easier to do with K State's situation because as bad as you know, relatively as Patrick Mahomes' receivers might be in the NFL, K State's are probably struggling on an equal or lesser level than those guys at this point. So uh I my criticism is of, of how the coaching staff handled it, not Will Howard, because I, I'm with you. I, I kept thinking in that game, okay, something will change here, but he was back to not getting very much help from his offensive line and you're down in a hole. You're, you're feeling helpless because you don't have the receiving help to, to maybe get things done. Um, it's a tricky spot to be in now in terms of the quarterback situation, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see Will Howard's numbers on the screen right now. Where, where do we stand? Like how much further can struggles go down before you, both of you guys would seriously entertain making a switch at quarterback because I think that's where some people are at. I, I think you need to be talked off the ledge. Like it was a terrible game, but there are a lot of other quarterbacks in K-State history that have been really good that have had some terrible games. Um, now maybe you can't really point them out, you know, in their like in their senior season, their last year uh, where that happened. But with Will Howard, like how much worse does this have to get right now? Um, his completion percentage dropped by over four points on, on Friday night because of how things went. He's up to seven picks on the year, but he's, you know, thrown for nine touchdowns, ran for six of them. He caught one. He's still being fairly productive for K-State. He just had one really bad game. So I'll, I'll let Drew go first here. At what stage, if ever this season, would you say, okay, we got to make a switch. We got to try Avery Johnson out. Yeah, it would probably take another game like that next week because that – and it's not even like, okay, he's bad next week. Like, I, I want him out. But it would take probably throwing three interceptions back-to-back -back games where it looks like he just isn't anticipating the right coverage or just isn't on the right page with the receivers. To at least 
try it. But like that would be the only point would be having multiple bad games in a row with three interceptions. And like that's why I threw out next week because I the hope is that something like Friday night doesn't happen again. But it, I mean, it, it would take that, I think. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think an equal, equally bad or close to as bad uh, two interception game or more in Lubbock would would start to you know another another loss. I mean, technically, we don't compl- with the unbalanced schedules. We don't completely control our own destiny, but you still have Texas, who's probably your main competition. I don't think West Virginia is going to. Uh, go the rest of the season without two or three more losses. So yeah. you still kind of can say we still control our own destiny to get to Arlington in a way, even with this loss, you got to win out more than likely. Um, but, but it's, that's, that's how you got to think at this point is, you know, if we want to go to Arlington, we got to win out and we play Texas. So yeah. um, we can get the tiebreaker with them um, and everybody else probably that's real competition, you know, which, you know, could be KU could be, uh, Texas Tech could be back in the mix with a win yeah. <laughs> against us. So, yeah. you know, it's it's you know it's funny. I'm, I'm, we're get, I'm sure we'll get to this, but I think we were optimistic that we were in the top three, and then it was everybody else. But it looks like it's really the top two, and then we're with everybody yeah. else. And it's unfortunate after this game, um, but I but I agree. I think you 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 ride Will Howard at least one more week, unless you have another disaster because. I think this is the absolute floor of play for him this season. Um, I don't think he can play worse than this. And I, I think um, you go in uh, next week in, in a tough, another tough road environment, another tough night game, thinking, well, we're going to get this figured out. We're going to get this fixed. And we're going to go win a tough game in Lubbock. I do. I do agree with that. I mean, I'm, I'm of the, the mindset, like you, you just got to go out there and hope something different happens. Uh, and and just assume that something different will happen because, I mean he he has been he's better than that he is better than what took place on Friday night against Oklahoma State, um, and you know maybe that maybe that was a bad situation where Oklahoma State could fix a lot of their problems and so everything that you just watch for two weeks if you were K State uh, is totally different than what Oklahoma State had been doing and you kind of get in there lost where. Um, like Oklahoma State's offense, I mean, you you said it, fan. They they ran it a little bit more, but when they throw the ball, it's it's pretty much the same thing. It's either Alan Bowman's getting out really quick, so he can't make a bad decision, or that boy is chucking it thirty yards down the field and just seeing what happens. Um, it's you know, it, so their offense they couldn't really change much other than you know how they broke down run versus pass, but defensively they can change a lot, and that's what K State was watching and trying to figure out. And I mean. Oklahoma State had been so, so bad against the pass. You should have been able to do more than what you did, so there had to have been some interesting wrinkles. So maybe it was poor timing for a bye where, you know, the health didn't mean much for K-State in that game. Uh, it was, you know, the, the guys that had been healthy and that are your best players, they just didn't come through, and you ended up in a in a really tricky spot. So uh, we'll have to, to kind of see what it brings in Lubbock this coming week. Yeah. Uh, as for uh, some other notes about the game on Friday – um, we can, you know, quickly toss in any other thoughts that we had. Um, they weren't ever really able to get the run game going just because they were down. So the only thing that they used was Will Howard to try and break off some big ones. Um, I think that's just kind of the position that, that they're in right now is you want to be able to establish Will Howard as, you know, is the guy and going out there and being successful and can throw the ball over the place. But I mean, this team might need to think a little bit more about, and it's tough because the offensive line had struggled, and they it was clear that the the coaches didn't trust the run game because of the offensive line. But this is probably a team that is going to need to shift back into being more focused on what DJ Giddens and Trayshawn Ward can do for you, uh, if that's going to be the outcome on Friday night in, in most games. Yeah, I, I, I think that's true. Um, the run game, actually, you know, even with even taking out Will Howard's long run. On run calls, K State had 160 yards on 35 calls, uh, 45% success rate, and average 4.6 yards per carry, which isn't awesome, but it's it's not terrible either. I mean, we had some decent plays in the run game as the game progressed. Um, to me, I mean, the first half 
the first half pass numbers are this 14 calls, one yard gained, two successful plays, and one of those was a first down that got six yards, and then the passing touchdown to Ben Sinnott, which was a really nice play, by mm-hmm. the way, that Phil Brooks almost screwed up. Um, under so that's under half almost a half un, under half a yard of play with a 14% success rate. You are not beating anybody when your passing game is that bad for a half. Like even the second half, 140, yeah. 141 yards, 21 snaps, 6.7 yards per pass play, 43% success rate. If we do that the whole game, we win by two touchdowns. I mean, it's amazing how bad the passing game was in the first half. I, it's 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 mind-boggling to me that it was that bad. Because the rushing game wasn't great, you're right, but it was <laughs> It you know with with an hour's run 230 yards on the ground on yeah. rush calls 6.4 yards of carry 40 percent success rate you're going to win a lot of games with that those kind of numbers in the Big 12. Yeah, and yeah. and Giddens and Ward were, were good in the game like they were yeah, they were times. fine yeah. you know they, they they were obviously points where they struggled but they you know everything worked out to where it was still good I just you might be in a situation where if if and again I don't even know like how much of this is really on Will Howard I just think a lot of this is on the receivers yeah. I mean. How many times are we talking about? I mean, you just said it right there. Like Phil Brooks about screwed up the touchdown pass to Ben Sennett. You you can talk about other guys that oh well you know Jaden Jackson didn't do this or you thought you know this was going to happen or RJ Garcia is struggling here um, and you, you start throwing all those out there and and how this is going down like the receivers are just this this really really big problem that K State has right now. Um, and and I just don't know that you're you're really going to be able to fix that at at, at any point this year. You're just going to have to kind of live with it and figure out how to play through it. Yeah, not not to pile on Philip Brooks, but the second pick, the pick six right before the yes. half, there, Philip Brooks and Will Howard Howard threw one route and Brooks ran another route and then said it went right to the Oklahoma State guy. Yeah, that was that was weird watching that play. We ran really what I would call a wheel pick. We we're we were trying to pick uh, Brooks's man with the outside guy. At, to me, it looks like Brooks ran the right route and Will made the wrong throw. I don't know if he expected Brooks to fall out uh, for for you know instead of running the wheel up the the numbers. But Brooks was behind the guy. Like he, that was one time there was sort of a little bit of separation. Um, but that that. Dude, <laughs> he had a heck of a first half. Yeah. Epps, I think his name was, you know, because Oklahoma State had one interception coming into this yeah. game, and the guy that got yeah. it didn't even play because he was hurt. So, or, or he was the guy that got the DUI. I can't remember. Um, and, and Epps was the replacement. And Epps was a replacement and had really an incredible game. So I, man, that 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 play was rough because that yeah. that pick six. Anytime you give up a pick six on the road, you're I, I would guess your winning percentage goes down by like 25%. Yeah. Well, and you know, one of the other things like we've talked about with the receivers this year is that at different points, the routes look lazy, the effort just looks low. Um, and, and, you know, unfortunately Philip Brooks, who I think has still been your best receiver this year, he's been the main culprit in a couple of those. Mm-hmm. Um, we saw it early in the season in some games and at some other various points and, you know, May, the, the the pick six may very well have been on on Will Howard and maybe Philip Brooks did the right thing there, but that is also one of those deals. It's just like anything else, you, you can only get so much of the the benefit of the doubt. But if you know you've made all these mistakes in your past, then when something else goes wrong, people are going to point the finger at you sometimes. And I think that's maybe a situation where we look at it and you, one could say, "Hey, that's on Philip Brooks," just because we know that he's made some of these errors already this season so it's 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 not a good spot and I you know I'm sorry if people have listened to this for 50 minutes and they feel even worse about how things went Friday <laughs> night but it cannot be understated how terrible of a loss that was for K-State I mean I I, I said it after the game and I to, to DY in a video that uh you guys right. will not get to see uh <laughs> look not only did the Cats lose on Friday night I lost as well uh, I had to take responsibility and and you know shoulder the loss for KSO. Uh, you're probably wondering, hey, I, I like watching the the instant recap after games. <laughs> hey, I like you watching it too because they get views and they they make us money. But guess what? Uh, somewhere after recording the video from walking up from the field at Boone Pickens Stadium to the press box, I lost the SD card, uh, so you won't get to see the, the, that video. But 
I said to him, like, I this is I can't remember a K State team that I thought that was at least good or you know had the pieces have a loss that was that bad. Like this Oklahoma State team, we all thought they sucked, and I I still think they probably do. Mm -hmm. I don't think Alan Bowman's a good quarterback. He's never been a good quarterback in his life. I don't think that they're they're talented defensively, and I, I still don't after what happened on Friday night. All of these things, I don't think Oklahoma State's a good football team. It was a disastrous loss. It was embarrassing. And I, again, like sometimes we can overreact about it. All of that is very fair here. Like that is fair to say. And you know, if it if it pisses anybody off, get over it. Like, you know, it we know that that college football coaches have been sensitive already this year. And look, I don't think that Chris Kleiman is just hit and play on a bunch of KSO videos in his free time. But if he is and this bothers him, it shouldn't. Like, you have to be honest with yourself. And I think he is right now. But, like, th this is just one of those deals where maybe 2017 Vanderbilt was, was one of those that you could throw up there as that. Like, road game, Vandy has clearly sucked for a decade now. Uh, and, you know, that K-State team, they ended up being fine that year. Like, that's the, you know, they won the Cactus Bowl and whatever, MVP Alex Delton. You know, no big deal. Hayes Hurler, uh, right, right guy over Skylar Thompson there. Um, but like that, you should not lose to Vanderbilt in that situation. But this K State team is better than that one. And it's just, I mean, there are bad losses from bad teams like the 2020 team or the 2018 or 2015 team, but those don't matter. Like those do not matter to me because those were bad teams. This is a team that should be good and that I still think is good. And they just had a really, really disgusting loss. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll throw out that uh, you could say Oklahoma State's still really bad because that it was only an eight-point game. Yeah, you know, Oklahoma State should have won by two or three touchdowns. Yeah, I would agree with that. And in the climate era, the only one that I would put up there was that West Virginia game his first year because West Virginia was like three and yeah, six. That's true. When, yeah. we, when we played that game, we were riding high and it had beat Oklahoma, and that was. The, the game in the climate area that reminds me of this one was that one where we just – we looked yeah. um, kind of unprepared, disinterested, et cetera, uh, compared to this one. You know, the COVID year, we lost to we lost to a Baylor team that had one win at the time. Yeah, that was bad. At Baylor, that was a bad one. But that was – I don't – that <laughs> – I know KSO message boards like to have arguments of whether it should count or not. I'm in the – it kind of doesn't count, especially, yeah. especially with K-State situation and – just trying to get games in so we could play yeah. and having so many guys out. So that's another conversation, but I, yeah, there's the Vandy game I think is a good, I mean, that one was shocking. Like this one is shocking to, to see, to see us play that poorly. Yeah, it was, it was bad. And, you know, we, we already talked about it. Chris Kleiman at least owned up to it. Um, and he's, you know, been very upfront about his frustration with it and everything. And, We'll see what comes out of this week. All right, let's uh, move on real quick. We'll get ready to round things out. Time for a little college football outsider. The Big 12 had a handful of games this weekend. It may have been tough to watch them after the Wildcats lost on Friday. But OU and Texas, they got things started on Saturday, their final Red River game in the Big 12, and it uh, ended with an Oklahoma win. Tell you what, as much as I think, you know, the, the I, I've, I've said this from the start, Brent Venables, it was either going to be much worse than Lincoln Riley or it was going to elevate Oklahoma to a level above what Lincoln Riley could get them to. Maybe we're starting to see some of that here. They beat Texas 34 to 30. I was very excited to see that. I know that, you know, a lot of people initially thought, hey, you want Texas to win that game. Well, now Texas has a loss. And the only realistic way K-State is getting to Arlington probably is by winning out. So you need to beat Texas. So whatever. I'm good with OU winning it because here's my stance on all of this with the, the realignment stuff. Texas has always been the snobs in this. They have been the coattail riders of Oklahoma success, and they try to lump themselves into the conversation with them like, oh, yeah, we're a package deal. Brand-wise, yes, you are. What you have done on the field, no, you are not. And I think that Oklahoma was a follower in this situation because they didn't have much of a choice they could not fall so far behind Texas if they stuck around. And so when Texas was making the move, OU had no choice but to go. I don't think, you know, Oklahoma has been 
terrible in any of this and the way that they've handled things publicly. Like, I think they've been as respectful as you can be when you're leaving and, you know, hanging a conference out to dry. Texas has been the ringleader in all of this. Texas will forever be the one that has been a thorn in the Big 12 side for the last, what, we're going on 27 years now. Um, that's they're, – they're the problem child. Oklahoma's just like, I can't really do anything. Like, I rode here with them, you know. I, I have to. I have to, unfortunately. So, I, I'm glad Oklahoma won that game, especially since I still think Quinn Ewers is a fraud and is, you know, he's a good quarterback, but he's nothing special. Uh, and I've and I've been pretty high on Dylan Gabriel, so I was glad to see Oklahoma win that game. Yeah, and I, I give Venables a lot of credit for kind of fixing that defense that was really bad last year and has played a lot better. Um, even you know going into the game, Oklahoma was, was actually ranked higher in, in many of the metrics. Um, so um, I thought it would be a tight game. I thought it would be a prove it game for Oklahoma, and it, I think it kind of turned out to be a prove it game where Oklahoma kind of proved who they are. And now they have a, besides this game, they have a very easy big 12 schedule yes, of who they play and who they don't play. So um, it's going to be tough for them not to make Darlington, in my opinion, then it's going to be a race to see if anybody can topple Texas and get to that second spot. So, you know, in case they still has a chance to do so. I know right now we probably feel like there's no chance, but again, I always go back to you're you're probably never, you're not as bad as your worst game. And, you know, last year, we weren't as bad as the Tulane game for sure. And I think ever, after the Tulane game, people thought we wouldn't win five games. <laughs> and, yeah. You know, we ended up winning the big 12. So who knows what's going to happen? I mean, it sucks to lose that game Friday night, but hopefully this team can galvanize, be galvanized by it and see what happens in the league. Cause I think it's wide open. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's still wide open. Yeah. I mean, I, we were talking before we started recording and I said, I think I know less about the league yeah. after this week. Like, because I, I thought that Oklahoma was fine, but I, I didn't think that they would win. TCU wasn't competitive at all in Ames last night. Baylor wasn't competitive at home against Texas Tech. Like, I, I just feel like the league is has never been as wide open as it is right now. And I usually try to do power rankings in my head before <laughs> – Publish and I have absolutely no idea what I'm going to do for this week. There's a lot of uh, mental gymnastics that's going to have to be done to figure out how how does the transit of property work this this week in the Big Twelve. I think one thing is clear: uh, UCF is soaring way, 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 way down the rankings now. Um, they could not stop uh, a third grade running back if they tried. Uh, their run defense is horrendous, and I mean that's something that KU does really well, regardless of who's playing quarterback. Um, especially since Lance Leipold thinks that his second best running back on the roster, Daniel Highshaw, is actually who should be starting the game for him. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know how Lance Leipold is so infatuated with Daniel Highshaw. He's good. Devin Neal clearly the better running back mm-hmm. there, uh, but he loves him some Daniel Highshaw. They dominate UCF fifty-one to twenty-two yesterday. Uh, so that's UCF now. Two blowout losses in the Big 12 and one one game where you blew a 28-point lead to lose. You're 0-3. Uh, that's, that's a bad start to be in a Big 12 school if you're UCF, and I don't know really how they recover, but they're going down. And then Texas Tech thrashes Baylor 39-14. to Tech just kind of lit them up from the start, pulled away. Uh, Baylor still as bad as we thought they were. That win against UCF just showed us that UCF isn't a very good team. Now, I will say UCF was moving the ball and started off fine until John Rice Plumley got hurt again. I think he only ended up playing three or four plays in that game, and his knee started acting up, may have re-aggravated it. So we'll see if that's anything that he he plays the rest of the year or comes back at any point. It could change the math on UCF, but they weren't very good yesterday. So uh, outside of OU and Texas and you know UCF's free fall, what – which game did you take the most out of yesterday or performance from the rest of the Big 12? I would get I would go Iowa State TCU. I think, you know, I don't Iowa State, I think probably is getting better on offense. That because that was really their Achilles heel with with their young quarterback kind of figuring some things out. Um, and their defense is still really good. But I think it also probably says a lot about TCU and where they're at and how in the world Chandler Morris was a starter last year over Max Dugan to start yeah. the year is still perplexing to me because we've seen nothing from him that shows that he's, you know, ready for this moment. Um, 
you know, it looks like the four new teams are pretty bad, and now Baylor and and maybe TCU are down there when in the bottom half of the league. And then can the other teams manage to not stub their toe against those teams and then beat each other up in the middle? And and can someone step up and challenge Texas at this point? So, yeah, TCU being I, – I didn't anticipate them being this bad. I probably didn't anticipate Baylor being this bad either because I think they're really bad. Um, but the, And then you have Houston down there and Cincinnati, and it's going to be interesting to see if any, if any of those – New four teams can approach the middle uh, or upper half of the league. I'm, I'm not sure if they can. Well, I could have told you about Baylor. Dave Aranda, <laughs> fraud. Uh, that's, I mean, I've, well, I saw I called, that one from a mile away. I called that one last year as them falling off. I didn't expect it. I thought they'd be kind of similar this year as to where they were last yeah, year. This year they're falling even more. That's a little bit of surprise. I mean, they're very lucky that they beat UCF. They should be a, a one-win team. Yeah, I mean, uh, and the crazy thing about it too is, I think you could have pointed at a lot of fingers at like Blake Shapen, uh, in in past years and been like, oh, yeah, he's the problem. I I don't think you can do that right now. Like, I think he's trying to play well. I think he, I don't just don't know that he has a great offensive line, uh, and and other help around him. Like, he's been clean, which is at least you know something for him. Um, Drew, what, what did you take away from the Big 12 yesterday outside of OU Texas and UCF being uh, an abomination? Uh, I mean, I, I guess I'll say Texas Tech maybe back on track a little bit. I mean, I know we don't think Houston and Baylor are very good, but Texas Tech has looked pretty good. and mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're winning Saturday away from us talking about how if uh, they beat K State, how Texas Tech is right back in the in the title hunt. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the worst. I think that was the worst thing to happen for K State. You lose in Stillwater, and now Texas Tech has all this life shot back into them with mm-hmm. how things have played out because they have played well this year. Wyoming is a good football team. They've proven it. I mean, they just they beat Fresno State last night. Fresno was a top twenty five team. Was playing well. Wyoming hung with Texas for quite a while in Austin and then tech, you know, they, they could have beaten Oregon who very well could be one of the four playoff teams this year based on how they've played. Tech has not played poorly outside of that game in Morgantown and, you know, Tyler shut gets hurt in that game. So maybe that changes everything a little bit for them, but they're playing better now. Baron Morton is a guy that has, you know, came in last year. So he's got experience playing uh, them having life and now K-State going into a night environment uh, that's probably going to be a pretty fired up Jones AT&T Stadium is not the best outcome for K-State, uh, which I'll transition into this for our one question for next week. Mine is pretty simple for K-State. Can you find a way to win? Because, again, they're in a situation it does not matter how you do it, what it looks like, you have to win in Lubbock or – no matter what the outcome is and how it's done, a loss is going to have a lot of questions and a lot of people on edge freaking out. And if you thought things were bad after the loss at Oklahoma State, that's one bad loss. But two losses in a row is much worse than one bad loss and then a win to back it up. Uh, K State, you got to find a way to win this week. And that's my one question is can you beat Texas Tech on Saturday night? Yeah, I would I would say mine would be um can Will Howard how does this offense and specifically Will Howard respond to a really poor game and can the passing game be a strength for this team um after we I think it was a pretty good strength for this team last year. Um but can can they get those issues figured out with wide receiver and, and find ways to make plays in the passing game? Because they have to do, they're gonna have to have success in the passing game to, to win in Lubbock for sure. And and can they get that figured out this week will be my biggest question. Uh, not not to beat a dead horse, but uh, my, mine is just how do you get off the mat? I mean, that, that was the most upset slash angry I think we've seen climate or players after a game. How does that flip the switch this week? And that's the best, that's the worst that you've played if you're a K State player in since probably 2020. So how do you respond to that? And real quick, off of that, 
I, mean, I started the show talking about it. Like, I, I think it's fair to question and, and try to figure out, like, where is the actual leadership on this team? Like, how, how do the players, like, who knows how to step up and do this? For guys that haven't done that before, there is a scenario where they don't respond to this in a good way. Like, they, they don't know how to do this properly. And so the way that they try to lead this week leads to maybe not a change, but it, or, but it could be an even worse outcome if you don't know how to properly try to get guys moving in the right direction and, and doing all this stuff. So that's something that's going to be interesting to watch because you're right. Everybody is pissed off. Everybody's trying to figure out, you know, what the issue is. They're, they're not happy with how they played in Stillwater, but not only are they going to have to figure out how to play better on the field, I think that there's other stuff, you know, emotionally and, and mentally that they have to try and figure out how to do better. And if you've never had to be the guy in charge of doing that, it could make things a lot trickier uh, moving forward, and we'll see how it goes with Texas Tech. But the good news is if you win in Lubbock, you have back-to-back -back home games that are very, 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 very winnable. Like, those are bad teams. And you talk about Chandler Morris. He's not been great. He got hurt last night. I think it was a knee injury, so we'll see, like, if, you know, how, if he's even available, if TCU's down to a different player at that point. So you just got to find a way to win in Lubbock. Then everything's kind of back on track. And yeah, I mean, Arlington is, is probably a fever dream right now, but you at least still have a path and you can get things moving in the right direction. And I think all three of us would still agree that the guys that played on Friday night are still good enough at their best to win a lot of games in this league. And they can, they yeah. still are guys that I believe, even though, you know, not, not a high probability they can still go to Austin and compete with Texas. I would not be shocked if they won that game. Like they, they still have the guys to do that. You just have to prove it because you can have all the talent in the world, but it can be left in the tank. You can leave a little in there. You just have to find a way to empty it if you're K state. So we'll see if they can do that starting on Saturday night in Lubbock. And then we will go from there. So that will do it for this edition of the KSO show. Thank you for watching and listening. Make sure that you are, taking in K-State online in every way you can, whether that's over at On3 or you can do it here on the YouTube and the podcast platforms for KSU underscore fan and Drew Galloway. I'm Mason Voth. We will be back next Sunday with the KSO show, and uh, Derek Young will join me on Monday as we tie a bow for one last time on K-State's ugly night in Stillwater. He'll try and rebound next week and love it.